Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to open up some older test gear and see what we can learn through their design. So basically what we're going to do is open this thing up and read it like a book. So we can get an idea of what the engineers were thinking when they designed this thing. And sometimes we get to encounter people's modifications throughout time. Sometimes it's for the better and much of the times it's for the worse. So anyways, you never know what you're going to find in these older pieces of gear. So let's get started. This is the older test gear that we're going to be taking a look at today. And yes, it does look pretty ugly. You're probably asking yourself, why did you buy these things? Well, the price was right, $5 a piece at a local ham radio swap meet. And if you really look at it, the parts and pieces inside these oscilloscopes definitely exceeds $5 a piece. Now, when I bought both of these, I'm thinking, you know, I could probably make one really nice one out of the two and convert it into a really useful piece of test gear. So a lot of these older oscilloscopes, you know, they can still prove their worth by being converted into something useful nowadays. And that's what's going to happen to one of these scopes when it gets fixed up. I haven't determined which one I'm going to do yet. I'm pretty sure it's going to be this one here because this one looks like it's been sitting at the bottom of a lake. Look at this. There's mud on the knobs. So it's going to be very interesting to see inside this oscilloscope and see what lurks behind the, uh, behind the case here, or inside the case. Look at the graticule. You know, looks like somebody tried to tape it into place. And as you can see, they're pretty trashed looking, this graticule and this one as well. Luckily, what I'm going to convert this into doesn't require the use of a graticule, so I can completely remove that. The rubber is still good around the CRT, so that can be cleaned up. I imagine this one here, this tape has probably made its way. Yeah, it might be able to be removed. A lot of the time when you put certain tapes onto rubber, it almost becomes part of the rubber. But this stuff might actually come off. At any rate, this one here is in nice shape and all the knobs are complete. So everything's you know, complete on this scope and complete on this scope. So basically, I really have two complete devices. It's basically just choosing which one would be the easier restoration and maybe the one that isn't so trashed inside. Who knows what's inside this, you know? It could be anything inside here at this point. You see this one here is you know, handles just about coming off. Whereas this one is in quite a bit better condition. Looking at the case, the case on this is a little bit rusty. And this one here looks quite a bit cleaner, but this has got, you know, a really bad dent here and some other issues with it. So it might be easier just to clean the case, repaint the case on this one and put that on maybe this one here. Or we'll have to see as we go along. We'll take a look inside both of these scopes and see which one is the better restoration candidate. Again, each one of these is going to have a very interesting story to tell. And we can also get an idea of what the engineers were thinking of when they put these things together originally and maybe even come across some modifications as well. So what I'm going to do is move the camera around and this one here is the really ugly one. So this is the interesting one. Let's take a look inside this one here first and then we'll take a look inside this one here and determine what's the best course of action. In order to get inside this oscilloscope, it looks like I have to remove this screw. This one here is already missing. And on this side, looks like there's only one screw here as well. And on the back side, looks like the cord would probably come up to this point here. I imagine during disassembly, the grommet, you'd be able to push this back into the case. And then the cord itself would probably go right through. So obviously if the grommet's in here, the, you know, the plug won't fit through the grommet. So you have to push the grommet out. Rubber is pretty solid on here. I'll see if I can press that through and get this thing out of the case. So that's what I'll do right now. So just remove those two screws. And then I imagine this should slide forward. I've removed the screws on the side here and it looks like that's all that's holding this together. This thing is missing screws all over the place, including some on the bottom as well. So what I'm going to do is just put my hand on the face here and then tip it on its face. And hopefully this is going to try to come out of the cabinet when I lift this. And it still feels like it's pretty solid. So the screws on the bottom here have been removed. You can see the screw here and it looks like there is another one just in behind there. I don't know if you can see that. Right in there looks like it's uh, right there is a little threaded hole in there. So and this here is kind of missing something over here. So it looks like it's still stuck in there. So let's see. 
because the top of it wants to come out. It's just the bottom. This is loose on this side, but it seems to be pretty solid down here. So I'll just move this over here again. This is, well, it looks like that might be threaded. It is. They're hiding a screw inside that little foot there. So, maybe it'll come off now. Let's see. Aha! There we go. Look at that big wax capacitor. It's got nothing but trouble written all over it, that one. Nice little circuit board on the top. A bunch of capacitors here standing up. So what I'm going to do is get rid of the case here and get the camera situated a little bit better so we can take a nice close look at this. All right, so what do we have here? Looks like we've definitely got a lot of dust. You see I've rubbed my finger on here already. Lots of dust inside and cobwebs and things like that. The circuit board itself looks to be in very nice condition on the top side and it really doesn't look like there's a whole lot of tampering. So this thing might have just been thrown in a puddle for a whole bunch of a whole bunch of time. Who knows? So let's see what the tubes are here. I can see some numbers there. 12AT7 it says. And on this one here, it's also a 12AT7. You can see that there. The capacitors are made by American Radionic Company Incorporated. Interesting capacitors. All the band ends are towards the circuit board here. It'd be interesting to know if they followed the rules back then. I don't know if these are a wax. No, it feels like that's an epoxy. There's some form of glue in the top there. So they're not filled with wax. It'll also be very interesting to see if these are leaky or not. We have some... Oh, another one here, American Radionic here. Seracap down here. Let's take a look at the other side. Let's take a look at the tubes here. What do we have for tubes? Put the light in there. 6BR8A, this one here, you can see the numbers there. And the one in the back is a 6BK7B. I don't know if you can see the numbers on the tube there. Hard to get that in the camera. 6BK7B. This one right here. More American Radionic Company capacitors here. Looks to be in very nice condition. Inside, anyways. Aside from the outside looking like the thing's been thrown into a puddle or something. Filter capacitors most likely are definitely toast. This is the vertical yeah, vertical range right here. A bunch of adjustment capacitors and some accurate resistors here. Another Sarah cap here. Let's take a look at the other side. Got another two tubes here. I can tell what these are just by looking at them. You know you've been around tubes too long when you can look through the glass, see the internal structure, and know what they are. So this is going to be a 6C4, and this is going to be a 6X4. Now, in a lot of oscilloscopes, they use 6C4 tubes as a high-voltage rectifier. It's a triode, and they just use them as rectifiers. This is going to be the 6x4 here, which will be the low voltage rectifier, now in today's speak, it's definitely not low voltage. When they say low voltage, they mean 450 volts or around there, all right, up to 450. The high voltage rectifier here would be up to 1,000 somewhere. I would imagine, just due to the rating on this capacitor here, we can tell that this is the high voltage capacitor, just because it's 1,000 working volts DC. And it's a mighty big capacitor, 0.5 microfarad, so half of a microfarad. So you see the chassis here, we have the band end here tied to the chassis. It's installed correctly, even though this is a negative supply. 
can see up here, wire goes here right to the CRT, and then if we follow the purple wire, it goes right to the high voltage rectifier. So I'm tempted just to plug this into my current limited variac supply and just bring it up slowly and see if I can get a trace on this thing. So it's current limited. What can go wrong? Maybe we can release some smoke here. Power transformers. I don't know. This kind of looks interesting. Like somebody's maybe taking the cap off or something on here what this is, some sort of a sealant or paper or something like that. This is the horizontal sweep selector. The capacitors here, more American Radionic Company Incorporated capacitors. Interesting to see if these things leak or not, whether they're paper or some um, interesting combination of elements. They've changed capacitor technology so much in these days. So Sprague was uh, changing to all sorts of different kind of capacitor compounds, dye film capacitors they called them, and they still actually show very low leakage today. So maybe these are some form of a dye film I really don't know at this point. So what I'm going to do is check these out with you guys. So what I'll do is I'll desolder one of these things first and uh, we'll check it for leakage and see if these, uh, if these are leakers or not. Let's remove one of the capacitors from the board. So one of the capacitors is right across these two areas right here. So I'll remove the solder off of this and off of this little pin right here. As you can see, the circuit board is in very nice condition as well. They didn't remove all the flux residue, but other than that, it looks really nice, nice and clean. Again, not a whole lot of tampering. You know, it looks like it's pretty clean here. So in order to get my desoldering tool in here, I removed the two tubes, as you can see down there. I'm just going to push this wire out of the way here so that I don't burn the wire and I'll get my desoldering tool in here now these older circuit boards are a little finicky so you don't want to really spend a whole lot of time with your desoldering tool on here solder wick will pretty much destroy these things just due to the dwell time and there it is it came out like that so point one at 200 working volts DC so I'll get my capacitor tester. And let's see if this thing leaks or not. All right, let's see if this capacitor is leaky. So I have to have the brightness down here so that the eye tube shows up on the camera. So I just have this little area lit up down here. So now before I do anything, I want to make sure that this is on three volts and I want to make sure that this is on discharge because this can stay in the leakage position. If I have this up at 600 volts and I leave that in the leakage position, and I touch these leads, I'm in for a nasty surprise. So, in leakage, starts at three volts, needs to be paper and mica, etc. So, what I'm going to do is attach the leads here to the capacitor. You can see that. So, I'll just put this off to the side here where it's out of the way. And click on leakage here. Now, if this eye closes, that means that this capacitor is leaky and it should be good up to about 200 volts. And it's starting to show leakage. Slowly creeping open there. Put it up to 200 and see what it does. It's taking a long time to charge. So chances are this capacitor is leaky. You can see it's trying to open up. Uh, just about tried there again. So we definitely know. There it is. So chances are they're leaky. They're good right to, well, this is good right to its maximum voltage, which is 200 volts. And as you can see, the eye isn't completely opening. And it does show signs of, you know, like it's kind of flickering up and down. Now my soldering iron is going off and on on the bench, so the voltage is probably going up and down a little bit, and that's why you're seeing that happen. Let's just shut my other iron off here and see if that settles off. A little bit. Turn the iron back on, see what happens. Let's 
See, the iron definitely affects it. So very sensitive. So what I'll do is I'll get a good point 0.1 and I'll show you the difference. Be right back. All right, so here is a good point 0.1 capacitor. This is a modern one right here. Made by Illinois Capacitor. Good brand. So what I'll do is I'll just attach the leads up here. Put this off to the side. And again, as you can see, it's on discharge and down at 3 volts. So this capacitor is rated at 630 volts, all right? So this only goes to 600. So what I'll do is I'll turn that right up to 600 volts. I'll click this to leakage and watch how quickly that eye opens with a capacitor that doesn't leak. That's a good capacitor. So discharge again. See how quickly that charges? No problems there. So now, when this is in the discharge position, it also discharges the capacitor. It's always a good idea to never take the chance. So before you go about removing a capacitor from a jig like this, just in case that the unit itself, this thing here, is not discharging the capacitor, it's always a good idea just to short it. So I've got a jumper here and everything is fine. So I'll get that one out of the way and I'll show you the other one again to show you the difference. So you saw how quickly that eye opened. So here we go. Go to here again. Go to here. I'll put this up to 200 volts. It's maximum. We'll be nice to it. We'll go 150. All right, now watch the leakage. See how long that took to open? So you can definitely tell it's leaking. So all of those capacitors in there are most likely going to be very leaky, including that really ugly wax capacitor, that 0.5 microfarad 1000 volt one. That one's going to be a real big problem. But I'll still put it on my current limited supply and bring it up slowly here and see if uh, there's any life in the oscilloscope. I have the oscilloscope attached to my current limited Variac in isolation transformer. And I'm going to start this off at about 60 volts. So I'll just move my Variac here to the 60 volt mark. About there. And I'm going to turn on the AC supply. And if I'm lucky, this oscilloscope will come to life. It looks like the dial light or the indicator light is coming on. A little red lamp down here on the bottom is lighting up slightly. You can see the reflection of the bulb in behind here. And it also looks like the tubes are lighting up. So I'll just zoom on into that. So that's a good sign. The filament winding in the transformer is working. So far, the current limiting is absolutely fine, no problems. So nothing is going wrong. So let's see if we can get anything on the screen here. It's at about 60 volts and nothing is going wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this up to about 85. Help things out just a little bit. So the tubes will get a little bit brighter in the background there. Okay, so first thing we want to do is turn the brightness right to the maximum here. And that should help us. So it's always a good idea to try and center everything, center the vertical position and horizontal position and everything on the front of the scope here. So I'll move the vertical position around. This is right at its max. Look at that. There it is. I'm actually pretty amazed that this thing is working. It's out of focus. So this is the focus up here. That's working as well. Well, the scope that looks like it's been sitting in a puddle is working. Let's see if there's any vertical sensitivity. There is. Well, that's kind of a horseshoe moment. Well, the oscilloscope is working. Makes me wonder. The uh, really ugly looking scope is working. Maybe it's the nice one that doesn't work. I better shut this thing off while, while everything's working. So that's a good indication that the CRT is good. 
it was at 85 volts there it's not even up to the you know, standard 120 all the tubes are lighting up lots of brightness it focuses so really this oscilloscope could very easily be resurrected and turned into a working device or turned into a, a nice piece of test gear all right well we know that this one's working let's grab the other oscilloscope and see if it's going to work all right so here's the nicer looking oscilloscope Got the cords and everything all wrapped around and nice big floppy jack on the bottom there so this looks like the same deal as the other one it's missing screws all over the place so let's take this screw out here nicely driven in on an angle let's see this one here this out of the way and in order to get this out of the case Find all the cords and everything out of here. And let's see let's see if there's any screws on the bottom. Looks like this one here, somebody had put the foot on the bottom of the other scope in this hole right here. So that's what's stopping the face from coming up. There's empty right here and there's some tape and like some lint or fuzz stuck on there. So I think this one should just fall out. And get rid of this cable on here. And I'll just lean this on its face. I'll put my hand here like so, so that it doesn't fall out as I'm doing this. In order to completely remove the back on this, I'll have to take this rubber grommet off. I don't know if you can see this here. I guess you probably can't. I'll have to push this rubber grommet through the case as well. So squish it together and push it in. Okay. Is it going to come out? Let's see. Looks like the bottom's a little different on this as well. No, nope, it's stuck in there still as well. Maybe some of these are holding it. Maybe did I miss a screw? No. Nope. It just doesn't want to come out. Maybe on this one, these act as mounts as well. It doesn't feel like it. And this one here. I don't think so. I think it's just being fussy. Let's see. What else would be holding this thing in? Oh, no. I think it is coming out. There it is. It's just... It's just being fussy. Oh, this one here already has caps that are a poly style capacitor. So all of these will not need to be replaced. They'll work just fine. This one here will have to go. Yeah, all nice poly style capacitors here. So maybe a more modern device. What I'll do is I'll reposition the camera again and we'll take a closer look at this one here. Okay, so let's see what they've done in this, if they have done anything or whether this is stock yet to be determined. So again, this looks like this has polystyle capacitors inside. It'll be interesting to see if they've put them in the, the correct way as well. You can see all the lines here. So that'll have to be compared to the other oscilloscope. We'll take a look at that here in just a little bit. The tube here is a 6CL8. See that? 6CL8, and on the board it's marked 6BR8 or 6FV8. So somebody's been in here and changed those around, possibly. They are RCA tubes. So I don't know, maybe they just substituted those. I'll have to take a look into that here. Let's see on the bottom side. Now this has that standard kind of a fluxy looking residue left over everywhere and it really doesn't look like it's been tampered with it uh, it's looking it's looking pretty clean under here so I think that those capacitors were most likely put in 
when this was assembled. So most likely they just upgraded the capacitors because they found that those other capacitors were leaking, which would make a lot of sense. So RCA tubes in here still. As we can see here on the sweep selector, it's got the poly style capacitors there. They're everywhere in here. So this thing was just built with those capacitors. And the electrolytics here, of course, would have to be changed out. They're all 450, so 450 volts. So what is this? 10 mics, 20, 20, and 40, all rated at 450 here. And uh, the other one I can't see the ratings on. But in a little bit here, we'll take a look at the schematic, and that'll tell us. So here we go. On the back here again, we have this large capacitor put in. Again, with the line side towards the chassis, which is correct. And, yeah, looks like a little bit different potentiometer here than in the other one. So from what I can see, this is obviously put together, I guess you could say this would be a newer oscilloscope, let's put it that way. So they probably made some revisions over time. You can really tell, I mean, it, it looks well, like this is just put in here factory. All the tubes are all RCA. So whether this one tube over here, this one right here, was just something that you know would match up and worked fine and they just put that in, or whether somebody swapped that in over time, we really don't know. Very clean build, just like the other one. Whether this one works or not, yet to be determined. We'll try that out here in a little bit. Nice little shield on the neck here. You'll notice in both of these things, this is a very small and compact oscilloscope. So you can tell they were really thinking about the CRT here. We have a shielded transformer just below the CRT. Now, if you didn't have a shielded transformer here, say you had something with an open core, and you didn't have this nice little pipe over the neck of the tube here, what would happen is you would get probably some noise onto the trace, either that or it would shift it. So. They're trying to, you know, keep this thing as clean as possible, keep that trace as clean as possible on the screen. That's the reason they put this here. That's the only reason that they've put this here, is to basically stop any stray magnetism from affecting the beam in the CRT. A lot of the times they use a thing called mu metal, and that mu metal is very handy in some of the larger oscilloscopes to uh, keep the CRTs nice and clean, so to stop any stray magnetism from affecting it. So they've gone to, you know, all the steps to ensure that you know, they had a nice clean CRT or a nice clean trace with a shielded transformer here. So there's a lot of things that I notice in these scopes, you know, a lot of interesting thinking in here. And we'll take a look at all that here in just a little bit. But first of all, let's see if this thing works. Let's try scope number two, the nicer looking one. So again, it's hooked up to an isolation transformer in Variac that is current limited. And I'll turn it on right now at about 60 volts or so. And we can see the little indicator lamp has come on. And let's see if we have any glowing happening in the tubes here. Zoom on into this tube right here. And they look pretty dull. Is there a little bit of glowing happening in there? Let's get rid of the light here for a second. Boy, it's sure looking dim. It looks like there might be a little bit of light happening in there. Let's see down here. Can't see anything happening with those either. See the dial light on though. Now usually the dial light is part of the filament supply. So I'll give this just a little bit more. See what happens there. Yeah, I can see the filaments lighting up just a little bit. And I'll raise the AC supply just a little bit more here. And now we can really see them coming on. 
So that's about at 110 there. You see them lighting up back there. I don't think we'll see the bottom ones here because the getter compound is on top. No, you can see the little hole in the plates there where the two plates are separated right in the middle of the 6x4, right about here. A little bit of the cathode glowing in there. Let's see if we have anything on the CRT. I'll just give this a little bit of light so it can find focus. Turn up the intensity to the max. Nothing so far. Ah, look at that. This one's coming to life as well. Focus this. Well, two working oscilloscopes. Zoom out on that a little bit. So it's come to life. Just like the other one. Let's see if this has any vertical going on. It is. Vertical section's working, and since there's a line there, we know that there's horizontal deflection. Or I should say the sweep section is working. Well, I'll shut this one off as well. Just keeping the electrolytics in mind. Both oscilloscopes are working. So basically, in order to make one of these an oscilloscope that would be safe to use, this particular scope here, since it has all those polycaps, basically just need electrolytics. So let's take a look at both of the scopes and do some comparisons and take a look at their thought process when they were actually putting these things together or designing them. All right, so looking at both oscilloscopes here, this being the first one we looked at, we can tell by the capacitors here, this being the revised version here. The first thing I notice is they put the capacitors in all the same way in both units. So there was thought here. You can see that the band end is here. The band end is here, denoted by that little piece of silver. So this is the outside foil end. You'll notice that on these ones here, the band end is on the bottom on all three of these capacitors. Here's a little bit hard to see because of where they are, but the band end is all on the bottom. So the band is towards the back, and then you can see this wire comes towards the front. You can see the band is towards the back, and then the other side of the capacitor is towards the front. It's the same with these as well. You see the wire comes forward here, and the wire comes forward. So they're all put in the correct way. The band end on this one here is at the bottom, which is at the back side, and then we have this one coming forward. You can see the band end here is at the back side, all coming forward. So there was a lot of thought. They did think about orientating these capacitors correctly in both units. The reason that they've gone with these, obviously in this unit here, is because they found that these ones here developed leakage over time and probably caused some headaches, so they just got rid of them. Now, they filled these ones here with an epoxy, but that still doesn't matter because what's inside the capacitor is still decaying, and that's what's causing that leakage. Now, again, when I say leakage, I'm talking leaking electrically, not physically. These capacitors are not supposed to pass any direct current. When they start to leak, the capacitor is actually turning into a resistor at the same time. And that's why in that test that we did earlier when we used the capacitor tester with the eye tube in it, you'll notice that these capacitors here, the one that we tested here, takes longer for the eye to open. So effectively, it's taking longer for this capacitor to charge. And the reason that it's taking longer for this capacitor to charge is because it's developing resistance inside. It's, it's turning into a resistor. Whereas you see the brand new capacitor, when we use that Illinois capacitor, that yellow one, you basically, you know, you'd click the switch on the tester and the eye opens almost immediately. That's because it's not really turning into a resistor like this one here. So the resistance of that particular capacitor would be extremely high, the newer one. So not developing leakage at this point. So that's what I can see from the top. You can see they use different resistors in here. So the resistors in this unit are different, whereas in this one here, they're using more of a modern carbon film type resistor. And it's a mixture with carbon composition too. You can see the carbon composition resistors here and over here. So you can definitely tell that this here is a newer unit. So I'll just resituate these and we'll take a look at the bottom side.
Looking at the bottom side of both of these oscilloscopes here, the first thing I notice again is the capacitors. You can see the line side is at the front here, and they've got the line side at the front here. So the outside foil end is facing towards the front. So if you're rebuilding one of these oscilloscopes and you're using this as a guide, there you have it. You'll also notice that in these oscilloscopes here, you can see that there's an RCA symbol here, an RCA symbol here, whereas on this one here, you don't see the RCA symbols, but you see the, the same area of writing. So it tells me that the tubes down here are most likely original in both of these, just due to the fact that the writing is in the same spots on both of these. So the RCA is hiding around the other side on these two particular tubes here. You'll notice that they have a VR here that's an open style. So the carbon, uh, actually the carbon track here and the wiper are open and they've mounted them differently here. Whereas on this one here, it has a sealed unit, but it has the actual holes, you can see the hole here, to mount this particular type of VR in here. So you can see the upgrades as they're going along a little bit quicker to mount this instead of having to put, you know, screws and nuts in here to hold it down. Basically one center nut, you know, right over the shaft there. And uh, this thing is mounted in place. So you can definitely tell that this is the, the newer model here. Now what I'll do is I'll flip these onto the bottom side. Looking at the bottom of the oscilloscopes, we can see that the resistors here are different than these again. They're using these carbon film style resistors here. They've obviously upgraded something here because this one here is 8.2K ohms, right back here. I don't know if you can see that, 8.2K. Whereas this one here is 6.8K. You'll also notice a difference in the size of the filter cans. So you'll notice in the earlier version, they have a smaller filter can. In this version here, the newer version, you can see that the filter can is quite a bit taller. So they may have done this either because they switched manufacturers or there was an addendum done at some particular time. Maybe these capacitors held out under the heat. This is a pretty small unit. And in a case like that, chances are it's gonna get pretty warm. The capacitors are both rated at 85 degrees. It's just that these ones here are a little bit taller, maybe just a different run. You can see here that this here has this Sarah cap or radionic cap down here. Get this into the shot. See this here, you can see the band end is here. Whereas on this one, same thing, band end is here. This is this newer poly style cap. So there was really great care in making sure that these things were put together properly. The circuit boards on both of these look to be in very good condition. This one here is a little bit darker than this one here, maybe just a different run of board. I noticed that the switches here are all the same. You can see that they have shielding on both of them to stop the stages from interfering with one another in this unit here. Good plan. So kind of a flimsy little metal shield there, but, but you know the thing isn't going to be vibrating in use or anything like that, so not a big deal. Adjustment capacitors all look the same. And the wiring is looking pretty much the same in both of them. You'll notice that on the sides here, they did take care to loom everything. They took little pieces of scrap wire and twisted them together. So somewhat nowadays, like we would use a zap strap or as some people like to call them tie straps. You know, keep the wires all nice and loomed together. They've done that here. So they've taken care in doing that. So. When you look through this, you know, the, the time was spent to make this thing, you know, as good as it could be. You can see here, everything is nicely loomed. AC wires are twisted together. That's always very important. Whenever you're running any wires through a chassis or anything, you always want to twist the AC wires like this, and you want to tuck them as close to the chassis as possible. So this is especially important whenever you're building vacuum tube audio amplifiers. So you can see they've done that here. So you can pretty much tell where they're putting the AC lines just by the twisting. You can see on the bottom here, we have more twisted lines here. So these are obviously AC lines here. A little trick whenever you see things twisted like that. So on this one here, looking at the top again, 
You'll notice that they've also ran the wires here. They've tucked the wires underneath the CRT on this one here, whereas on this one they've ran them over top of the CRT. Chances are to maybe stop this from interfering on the bottom side here. Maybe it was interfering with some amplifier circuits or something like that. So there's some reason that they put this up on the top here. As you can see, a little bit of extra looming over here. Again, AC wires twisted together. This is running to the on-off switch. So this is carrying the line up to this point right here. So all in all, they did a really nice job on both of these scopes. They're very similar. It's just they've updated them a little bit. So you can see this one here. I should say this one is updated a little bit, whereas this one here you can tell is an earlier version. Let's take a look at the design of this RCA WO-33A oscilloscope. We'll start with a vertical section here, and then I'll work my way this way, and then we'll talk about the sweep section. So if you're unfamiliar with the way oscilloscopes work, this should probably give you a, a new appreciation for the reason why these things were so incredibly expensive back in the day, and in some cases still are to this day. Now, this is an analog oscilloscope. This isn't a digital oscilloscope, but the vertical section in this oscilloscope and in a modern oscilloscope can be basically looked at as the same thing. It's basically just an amplifier circuit. So in order to simplify this, if you're used to vacuum tube audio amplifiers, you can look at this section as just an audio amplifier. It really is that simple. Now, the reason that oscilloscopes get so incredibly pricey as their frequency range goes higher, so say you have a 100 megahertz oscilloscope, you know that that's obviously a lot more expensive than a 10 megahertz oscilloscope. Reason being is this amplifier section here, or in any oscilloscope, it's amplifier section in the vertical front end, needs to be able to amplify from DC to, say, 100 megahertz. And it takes quite a bit of design to make an amplifier section do that, to make it that incredibly broad-banded and, you know, work within parameters inside of the oscilloscope. Now, this is a much lower frequency oscilloscope. This is pretty old, so, you know, this doesn't go much beyond the audio region. But still, this here does deal with a little bit of RF, and it's capable of amplifying that as well. Now, this design changed throughout time in different types of oscilloscopes, the way that they put these particular sections together in order to make them broadbanded. And uh, of course, you know, the larger companies like Tektronix back in the day, they spent lots of time in the vertical section in order to make their oscilloscopes you know, work up to the higher frequencies. So back to this oscilloscope here, we'll start with a vertical input. This is where we feed the signal into the oscilloscope so that we can view it on the CRT screen. This is a multiplier probe up here times 10 probe. We'll just ignore this and we'll feed the signal directly into the vertical input here. So say we have a sine wave running into the vertical input here. It's going to hit this point one microfarad capacitor. The reason that this capacitor here is to block any DC. So if there's any direct current on this line, it's going to affect the bias or the operating point of the pentode section inside of this 6BR8A tube, and we don't want that to happen. So we put a blocking capacitor there to stop any DC from changing the operating point. That's the reason that when these capacitors in these older oscilloscopes, or say if you're working on an older radio, television, piece of test gear, audio amplifier, when these capacitors leak, they let DC through, so they're turning into a resistor. So you can picture a resistor jumping across this. That even a very, very high value resistor is going to change the bias because you can see on the grid, we only have a one mega ohm resistor tied from the grid to ground. So just say that this capacitor was leaky and say it was measuring about one mega ohm worth of resistance, we would have a nice voltage divider right here. So whatever you had here, if you had five volts DC here, you'd have 2.5 volts DC here. So you can see that any kind of leakage in one of these capacitors is going to cause big issues within a vacuum tube. Again, this is the reason that everything needs to be recapped from these from this particular era. Now, luckily, they were using polystyle caps in that other oscilloscope, so that eliminates a lot of the changing, which is kind of nice. So we have an AC signal here, so it's going to go through the cap. We have AC signal here. It's going to run down into the grid, which is the control grid inside of this 6BR8 tube. Now, if you want to locate the grids inside of a vacuum tube, it's very simple. To locate the cathode, it's the C. We'll C for cathode, right? So you can look at this little C that's like this. That's the cathode. 
The first grid is the control grid. The second grid is the screen grid. The third grid is the suppressor grid. And the fourth element here is the plate. So this is the anode of the vacuum tube. So we have cathode, grid one, grid two, grid three, and plate. That's how they're marked in a lot of tubes. Just know that the first grid is called uh, the control grid, the second is the screen, and the third is the suppressor. Now the reason that they're using a pentode in the first stage of this amplifier here is to give this a lot of gain. You can see that this has a screen grid here. Now you can picture the screen grid as somewhat of a booster grid. Now the actual reason the screen grid is in here, what it does in a pento tube is it lowers the interelectrode capacitance by creating an electrostatic shield inside of this tube when it has a positive charge on it. Now getting into that is a little bit more in depth in this video here. I'll explain more about pentodes, triodes, and tetrodes here in the future again on different schematics. There's quite a bit of explanation to do here. So by putting a positive voltage on the screen here really brings this thing to life and makes it want to amplify. So you can look at this tube here as basically an amplifier and the signal that's going to be present on the plate is going to be inverted. One other quick thing, a very quick way to troubleshoot audio amplifiers or find the signal path is keep this in mind, signal in the grid, then on the plate. So it's, you put the signal on the grid, it gets amplified, it's on the plate. So if we want to amplify it again, what are we going to do? Put it back on the grid of another stage, it's going to get amplified, be on the plate. If we want to amplify it again, put it on the grid, it's going to come on the plate. You can see the signal path already. Now, this is acting as somewhat of a phase inversion circuit here, and there's, this runs on a little bit different of a, you know, a little bit different principle. But still, it's a very easy way to follow the signal path here. And of course, you know, we'll have signal present on the cathode and cathode followers and things like that. But again, that goes beyond the scope of what we're doing here. So most of the time, if you're looking at a guitar or audio amplifier or lots of pieces of test gear and you want to follow the signal path, <clears throat> just follow the signal from the grid out the plate and that'll bring you pretty much along the way and you can scope that too you'll put a scope here put a very small signal here scope it you'll see a small signal on your scope put it here and it's going to be really big because this is doing its amplifying so that big signal will be present here again and then put it here and it's going to be even bigger now this stage here is going to be furnishing some drive here because of the low resistances here and that's going to be operating this 6bk7 tube here by having this resistance combination here as well also makes this tube just a little bit more broad banded and again i'll get into that here in the future so now the signal goes into the grid so you can picture if you're looking at a sine wave say you have an oscilloscope screen you have the line in the center all right you have a a sine wave so the line being ground look at the line is being ground that'll simplify this okay so you have a signal going positive coming back down and then going negative and then coming back to the line and going positive again and going negative. So that's basically a sine wave. So when you feed a very small signal here with a sine wave, so say the signal is going positive. When the signal goes positive, this tube is trying to turn on. So the grids control how the plate is basically going to be, you can look at it like this, how the plate is going to be trying to connect to the cathode, all right? The more positive of a voltage that you put on the grid, it's going to try and connect the cathode here and the plate harder. So it's basically, if you were to look at this as an internal resistance of the vacuum tube, as you bring the control grid positive, the resistance between the plate and the cathode is going to go low. So as this is turning on, if the plate is going to be pulled towards the cathode, say we have 120 volts DC here, right? Because this is our B plus line, all right? We have 120 volts DC here. What's going to happen if the tube turns on? Well, the cathode is connected to ground through a really low resistance. So this 120 volts, because of all of these soft resistances in line here, is going to get pulled towards ground. So this might drop from, say, 120 volts down to 40 volts. So you can see how maybe a little signal, maybe 1 to 2 volts peak to peak, we'll say here, we'll call that a small signal, okay? 1 to 2 volts peak to peak will drag this from 120 volts down to 40. Okay? 
So when this starts to go negative, when the sine wave here starts to go negative, this is going to turn off. So basically what's going to happen is it's going to shut the tube off and it's going to try and disconnect the cathode from the plate. The voltage is going to start to go high again. So then we get our upswing on the sine wave. As this goes right down to its off point, you know, this is going to be right, you know, as this basically goes off with the sine wave going negative, this is going to go right back up to 120 volts again. And you can see how we're going to get this sine wave recreated at the plate. Now, a lot of people think that the vacuum tube is some sort of magic device that's, you know, taking it and amplifying it within the vacuum tube. Well, no, it's not. All it's doing is it's taking the high voltage supply that's created by the 6x4 rectifier here and the small signal that you're feeding into the vertical input. Say you had a, um, an MP3 player or a CD player or a phonograph or something plugged into the input. That audio signal that's coming in here is just turning this tube on and off. As the tube is turning on and off, it's taking this voltage that's being dropped through these resistors here down to 120. It's taking this voltage and causing this voltage to swing up and down. So technically, this tube is recreating the signal that you're feeding in here using the high voltage from the power supply. And that's all the vacuum tube does, nothing more. That's how you get amplification. You're taking a higher voltage and you're swinging that up and down, all right, with a very small voltage. Vacuum tubes are voltage controlled devices much like FETs are. Of course, we're gonna have current here because we have resistors running down here. And when we start to turn this tube on, the tube will draw current and the voltage will go low. And that's what's happening inside this vacuum tube. Same thing with a triode, just less grids. Now, again, the introduction of the screen grid was very important to make tubes work at higher frequencies because putting a positive charge on the screen grid lowers interelectrode capacitance, effectively making a lot of the parts of the inside of the tube invisible to one another. Lowering capacitance means that the vacuum tube will operate at higher frequencies. Now, we're still dealing with lead inductance from the pin of the vacuum tube to the working components or parts inside of the vacuum tube. Lead inductance plays another very important role in a limiting factor in the frequency response of a vacuum tube or how high in frequency that that tube can operate. That's why if you look up an acorn tube, you'll see that the leads that run into the acorn tube run directly into the side of the envelope of the vacuum tube to keep the leads as short as possible to lower lead in inductance. Now, the same kind of idea happens with the CRTs in some oscilloscopes, and I'll explain that here in just a bit. The actual CRT itself is a big limiting factor in how fast the oscilloscope can be itself. So, and that again has to do with the length of the leads. So at any rate, this is here, the suppressor grid inside of a pentode tube, the whole idea of the suppressor grid is to stop secondary emission. All right, so what's happening here is when you put a positive voltage on the control grid, it's allowing electrons to fly from the cathode to the plate because the, ca the uh, cathode is tied to ground and the plate has a positive charge on it, right? We have it running from our positive supply here. When electrons, if say this tube is completely on, when electrons are flying through these grids here and hitting the plate, it very much mimics things in nature. So picture a wall and you have a hose with a high pressure nozzle on it and you're spraying a high pressure stream of water against a wall. Well, what's going to happen? It's going to splatter and spray all over the place. The same thing is happening with the electrons inside this vacuum tube. They're going to try and spray back into the tube again. That's called secondary emission. And the reason for the suppressor grid is to stop that. So basically they get stopped by this grid that is tied to the cathode, which is negative so that the electrons can't go flying back into the tube and creating noise within the vacuum tube. That's the reason for the suppressor grid inside of a pentode. Now there's tubes with lots more grids than this. We have pentagrid tubes and we have octodes and all sorts of different kinds of tubes. And I'll cover those here in the future in different videos when we deal with different items that have these tubes inside them. 
So we have an amplified signal here. Now keep in mind that the signal is inverted at this point, right? Because when the signal's going positive, this is getting pulled towards negative. So if, it's, if this is going positive, this is going towards ground. So we have inversion. So we have a signal here. We have another blocking capacitor to keep this DC from changing the operating point of the triode over here. In the triode, we have a cathode, control grid, and plate. That's all we have. This is again acting as an amplifier tube. And as you can see, we have, with these two resistors here, this tube is going to be drawing a lot of current, especially with a cathode resistor here. So this is going to be furnishing quite a bit of drive. So there'll be quite a bit of drive for this 6BK7 here. And the 6BK7 is what's going to drive the two vertical plates within this 3AQP1 CRT. Now, this isn't a push-pull configuration. So this is very much like a phase inversion circuit. So very much like a phase inverter in a guitar amplifier. If you look at this and you look at a long-tailed pair phase inverter circuit, you'll notice the similarities in this here. Of course, it's a little different because this has to work within an oscilloscope, but you'll, you'll notice the similarities. Now you'll notice that there's blocking capacitors here, 0 0.05 microfarad that run to the electrostatic plates inside of the CRT. This does not have a yoke. This has electrostatic plates inside the CRT to cause beam deflection. And I'll talk about that here in a bit. You'll notice the DC, which is around 250 volts is being isolated from the electrostatic plate. Yet we have 220 volts DC present here on each one. Now, the reason they have these blocking capacitors here and they don't just use the tube to basically move the vertical trace up and down is because if the tube ages and say one triode pulls a little more than the other, it's going to move the trace around with the age of the vacuum tube. One way to alleviate that problem is put blocking capacitors here and then use a separate supply to supply 220 volts to the deflection plates here. And you can see as you bring one side closer to ground, it's gonna move the beam up and down within the plate. You can see here, it says vertical position control. That's because you're changing the DC potential on either plate. So basically the potential is gonna do this and that's gonna cause the trace to move up or down inside of the tube. And it's the same thing for horizontal. The horizontal deflection plates, you'll see here horizontal position. It works the same for the horizontal amplifier here. This is very much the same as this up here. So that's what's going on within here. You can see they put quite a bit of time in here. They even included an, an, an astigmatism control here in order to you know, create a nice sharp trace. You know? So they, they've really put the time, the time and the effort into designing the scope, even though it is a low frequency scope. Now, these are known, again, as electrostatic deflection plates. You'll notice in televisions, they had a yoke on the, the CRT in the picture tube. Looks, looks like a whole bunch of windings of wire, and it usually fit onto the the... the the CRT like this and then the, the neck of the CRT would stick out there's winds you can see wires on them right at the uh, the CRT where it goes into the neck you'll see that aperture that you know uh, uh, device I should say called a yoke and what that's going to do is control the how the beam is moving across the screen here okay if, it, if this was magnetically deflected and that's what a CRT is in a television. Older TVs have magnetically deflected CRTs. This is electrostatically deflected. So by putting a, a, a voltage on these plates here causes the beam to move around. Now, since this is acting like a phase inversion circuit, basically what's going to happen is you're going to have this going like this back and forth between the two plates. It's the charge is going to be changing like this. And of course, if you want to draw a sine wave, if you have a vertical plate on the top and a vertical plate on the bottom, having the potential change between the upper and lower plates, obviously, is going to give us this, right? So on our vertical deflection plates, it's, you know, that'll be able to draw our nice sine wave. And I'll get into that here in just a little bit, a little bit more. So we have horizontal deflection plates, which are going to be doing the same thing now, except instead of going vertically, they're going to be going horizontally. All right. So now, if we look here at this 12AT7, this here is our sweep oscillator here. So this is going to be creating somewhat of a ramp looking wave like this. Now, the cleaner that ramp, you know, the better it looks on the CRT. Again, this is the magic in oscilloscopes here. Uh, an analog oscilloscope that has to work all the way up to 100 megahertz has to have a very nice designed uh, sweep section in order to create, to create that uh, perfect ramp. 
So if you start to get a ramp that starts to go like this and then come down more of a sawtooth, the sawtooth effect at the top is capacitance. And when you start to deal with capacitance, as this is slowing down and lingering, you know, it's going to affect the speed of the trace. As it gets to that lingering part up closer to the top, the trace will be fast and then it'll slow down as it gets to the end and then be fast and then slow down because it's more time in this area here as it's getting to the end, right? So you want that as steep as possible and then to come back down and then as steep as possible. Now, what's happening here is as this sawtooth is being created, that sawtooth will be present at this point right here. If this switch is in the right selector, all right, you can see that it's this... Uh, the uh, horizontal amplifier tube, the input is going to the external horizontal input here. So if we were to move the selector switch down, this is going to move down like so. So what's going to end up happening is this would be connected to here. So we would get our sawtooth or our ramp, whatever you want to call that, running into here, right? And we get the same action going on that we do up here between the two plates in the horizontal section. So as that ramp, as that, that sawtooth is doing this, this is voltage climbing on the screen. So if you're to look at this on another oscilloscope, you're going to see this action and then it drop and then this action again. As it's doing this, the voltage is climbing to a peak. It's getting to a peak. It's dropping back down to the point here again. You say this is at the baseline. It's dropping back down to the baseline. It starts to ramp again, drops back down to the baseline. So as the voltage is climbing, it's driving that dot across the screen horizontally. And then as it gets to the top, it's at one extreme end of the vacuum tube. And then when it drops, it goes back to the other side again, and then it starts over again. And we're getting this effect going across the tube. So from this side to this side, and then bang, back to this side really fast, to this side again. And you know how we see a line on the oscilloscope screen? Well, that's actually a dot moving so incredibly fast that it just looks like a line is being drawn across a CRT. And of course, uh, depending on the type of phosphor that you have in the CRT, in this case, it's a P1 type phosphor. All right, so it's a very fast phosphor inside this. I'll get into you know, determining you know, the, the numbering and the coding system of, of vacuum tubes and CRTs here in the future as well. So again, P1 phosphor, very, very fast. All right, so basically it's that as fast as that dot can chase across the screen, it's disappearing. If you had something like a P7 phosphor or something like that, as the dot's chasing across the screen, you're going to see a streamer behind it because the, the phosphor holds light a little longer, just a different type of phosphor. Again, I'll get into this here in the future. We'll stick to uh, keeping this simple today, as simple as I can at any rate. So as that dot's getting driven across the, stream, the screen, right, really, really fast, it looks like a line. So you can see how this thing is going to draw a graph on the screen and the earliest oscilloscopes were called oscillographs. So what's happening here is you can see we have a whole bunch of different capacitors in the horizontal sweep selector switch. So 0.22 microfarad capacitor right down to 15 picofarad. Now 15 picofarad is obviously going to be the fastest that this is going to move. So it's going to be creating an extremely fast sawtooth at that speed and that will be of course, the highest frequency setting of this oscilloscope, which isn't very high at all, but it's still the highest frequency setting. So now, of course, as you're feeding something, say you're feeding, for example, a 60 cycle sine wave in here, not a very fast signal, you have to adjust the sweep speed on your oscilloscope so that when you're looking at the screen of the oscilloscope, it displays that correctly. So basically you can look at it as a dot moving across the screen. All right, so this is creating that dot going like this. The vertical deflection plates are going to take that dot because this is working now. And if it's 60 cycles, it's gonna pull that dot towards the one deflection plate and then it's going to go like this. As it's moving along, it's going to go towards the deflection plate. Push-pull. This is a push-pull section here. So it's going to go towards one deflection plate as it's moving and towards the other. So you can see the faster you make this move, it's obviously going to spread that out. So the slower that you make this move, the more displayed cycles you're going to get in there. And that's basically what's happening. That's very simply 
you know, you just have a dot moving across the screen and this is deflecting it vertically, right? That's how these things work. Very, very simple. And again, you can see why an oscilloscope back way back in the day and even now are still worth so much money as the speed gets higher. Now, nowadays, since they're, you know, digital oscilloscopes, you basically don't have this section doing anything in here anymore. You still have a vertical amplifier section. The uh, the input to your oscilloscope is still a vertical amplifier. It's just that it's working differently. It doesn't directly drive any plates inside of a CRT. Now, back to the CRT here again. The CRT, again, is another limiting factor in how fast the oscilloscope can work because you're dealing with lead inductance, again, running into the actual CRT, and you're also dealing with capacitance as well inside of that CRT. You'll notice that, say you own an older Tektronix oscilloscope. If you don't, I strongly suggest you get one because they're great pieces of gear to have around. Look at the CRT and look at the way the deflection plates are placed within that CRT. You'll notice that the neck of the CRT has the connections midway up. The connections are almost right at the deflection plates. They're like midway up. They don't run all the way out to the pins in the bottom of the CRT, like in this particular vacuum tube here. They actually exit the pins right by the plates. Well, what are they doing? They're lowering lead and inductance by doing that, allowing the CRT to work at much, much faster frequencies. Again, lead and inductance and capacitance is your enemy when you're trying to make something work fast. That's the hill that you're trying to climb. All right. So that is the, that is the biggest portion of resistance to you whenever you're designing anything at high frequencies is that added inductance and capacitance that would be within that circuit. So moving on to the power supply here, we have a 6C4, which you can see they have the, the filament section of the 6C4 attached directly to the cathode and they're using this as a negative rectifier. So the cathode is attached right to one end of the winding. We have a negative voltage here, negative 680 volts is put to the cathode, which means that to this power supply, the positive end of the power supply is the chassis. So if you were to reverse your voltmeter leads, put your positive probe on the chassis and put your negative probe at this point, at the plate of this tube, the chassis on your oscilloscope would read positive 680 volts. Why aren't you getting shocked? Well, that's an incredible explanation within itself. First of all, we have isolation here in the transformer. There's no connection between the primary and the secondary side. And if you want to picture positive and negative uh, supplies here, I'll show you a very easy way to look at this just using two batteries. The 6X4 here is a full wave rectifier. This is what creates the high voltage for the rest of the, the unit. Now this is classified as the low voltage rectifier. This is classified as the high voltage rectifier. When they say low voltage, they mean 320 volts. And back in vacuum tube days, yeah, 320 volts is low voltage. So, but nowadays 320 volts to many people scares the, uh, scares the pants off them. So, and of course, if you did come across it, it would also shock the pants off you. So you got to be very careful in equipment like this. There's high voltage present everywhere. Again, you know, negative 680 volts, right? So you'll notice in this winding here, we have a full wave arrangement. So one winding goes to one plate of the 6X4, another portion of the winding to this, and then the center tap runs to ground. From the center tap to this point here is what creates our negative voltage here. Now, in order to explain the way negative voltage works, I've got two nine volt batteries. Okay, so this will greatly simplify things. This is the positive side of the battery here, and this is negative. All right, so we have positive, negative, positive, negative. Well, if we clip the battery together like that, we have positive and then negative, but the positive of this battery is attached here and negative is here. So if you take your voltmeter probe and you do this experiment, take the negative of your voltmeter probe, put your voltmeter on DC and then put it at this point. Touch the positive probe here, you'll get positive nine volts. Touch the positive probe here and you'll get negative nine volts. Same thing's going on here. Same kind of idea, just to simplify things. This is our troublemaking capacitor here, 0.5 microfarad. What's going to happen is this thing is going to leak so bad that it's going to blow the bonding wire off of the cathode 
and we don't want to do that so this is going to start to leak which we saw those you know those really large capacitors I'll, we'll take a look at that here in just a moment again that large capacitor in the back of the oscilloscope that 0.5 1000 volt my, um, uh, capacitor there 0.5 microfarad that is going to end up shorting out or getting very leaky and we don't want to damage this tube so this definitely has to go this is the troublemaking capacitor inside this oscilloscope aside from changing the electrolytics now these electrolytics will also end up going bad you can see they're all over the place 10 mics 20 mics 40 mics 20 mics they're here and over here we have 20 mics 20 mics and they're they're all over here so we have two canned capacitors in there those two larger cans those are going to have to be replaced or subbed out swapped out and um you know basically with a modern equivalent so that uh, you know nothing goes wrong within the oscilloscope again people like to reform these things bad idea you're going to reform these things you're going to leave your bench for oh 10 minutes or so and you're going to go grab a coffee and you're going to come back and your test room will be full of smoke and this transformer will be you know done at that point so just not worth taking the chance capacitors are cheap nowadays and uh, if you want to use this little oscilloscope you know for for a long ways down the road why not take care of it just not worth the risk we have a balanced filament system here so center tap of the filament goes to chassis ground and then this goes to each side of the filaments you can see that they're using the center tap of the 12 at7 here you can see them there both ends are tied together four and five are tied together and then nine runs to one side so you're basically taking a 12.6 volt filament and using the center tap and bringing it down to 6.3 very common with 12 at 7s 12 ax 7s 12 au 7s 12 ay 7s and uh, all of the above all of those tubes uh, you know 57 51s uh, all those types of vacuum tubes they're all like that right now over here we have v1 v2 v and v5 which are just going to be 6.3 volt filaments they're right across here and then we have our little pilot lamp right here which is our indicator lamp and that's why when I said when we saw the pilot lamp glowing that's a good indication that the filament winding is still good over here we have a bunch of capacitors that will need to be changed these are capacitors that tie from the line to the chassis here you can see they're in dotted lines here because they weren't in all of these oscilloscopes but in some of them so these will have to be changed with a modern safety capacitor x1 y2 type capacitor and you know just you, you want to get rid of these because if these things leak at all or short it'll bring one side of the ac line to the chassis and that presents a very big shock hazard now some people like to put three wire cords on these oscilloscopes that's fine but it also limits the way that this oscilloscope is going to work and if you want to test things especially negative voltages and things like that you have to be very careful with that third wire so that again is personal preference if you feel safer running that third wire up to the chassis by all means do it for my own purpose i leave them two wires this is the oscilloscope that's going to be turned into the dedicated signature tracer and curve tracer project this is the one with the poly style capacitor so there's not really a whole lot of restoration to do with this particular unit basically clean it up use some contact cleaner and the potentiometers and replace the electrolytic capacitors in this capacitor here maybe give it another line cord the thing is pretty much ready to be turned into that dedicated piece of test gear so this one here is the other one that needs all brand new capacitors and i may do a, a restoration on this one here down the road so in order for me to begin the process of turning this thing into a signature and curve tracer I need to get rid of all the weak points and the weak points being the electrolytic capacitors and this capacitor right here now since i need this area on the other side to mount another small circuit board that small circuit board is going to be a positive and negative power supply for the curve tracer what i'm going to do is move this capacitor i'm going to replace this but i'll move the replacement capacitors in this area here I'm going to free up this terminal tie strip here so I'm going to remove the line cord and move it to another area install another terminal tie strip in here all the replacement capacitors that would be all the capacitors in here will be now mounted to this terminal tie strip so all the barrels will sit in here like this and I'll make a nice clean install and that'll free up a lot of area on the other side so I'm going to need to install a small transformer here on the other side into a circuit board so that'll get all of that out of the way so this is going to be this one particular scope is going to be a dedicated piece of test gear here 
And if you're interested in following along with that, this will all be on Patreon. I'll have all the circuit board layouts, all the plans and schematics and everything there as attachments. You can print out the circuit board layouts directly if you have a laser printer. You can do the toner transfer method. Everything will be sized and everything. So there'll be the power supply circuit board there and the main curve tracer circuit board will be there as well. This one here will also be fitted with an adapter so that it will have a digital readout that's already part of the curve tracer project. So because that you can use an external digital readout with this oscilloscope, you don't need that little green filter with a graticule on it. So you don't need that at all. Just a basically a a gray screen like what you would see on this here is all you would need. You don't need that green filter, which makes things very nice. It also cleans it up. And of course the CRT looks a little bit brighter. It's not really, the, you know, it isn't the uh, brightness isn't taken down by that green filter. So if you're interested in me doing a complete restoration here on YouTube of this particular oscilloscope, there's quite a bit more to do in this one here. Let me know in the comments and in the future, what I'll do is I'll do a complete restoration on this one here. This one here has got lots of stuff that needs to be replaced. So all of these capacitors need to go and of course it needs to be cleaned up. Whereas this one here, all the capacitors are A-OK. -okay. They don't need to be changed. So quite a bit more to do on this. This would be a, an in-depth restoration here for YouTube. So let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. If you're enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more videos coming like this in the near future. We'll be talking about vacuum tube and solid state electronics alike. There'll also be lots of restorations, repairs, and teardowns in there as well. So lots of fun stuff planned for the future. If you haven't hit the subscribe button, you may want to do that. The oscilloscope that you've seen in this video is now going over to Patreon and it's going to be converted into a very useful piece of test gear known as a signature or curve tracer. The circuit board, the layout, the schematics and everything have already been designed and they're available to Patreons on Patreon right now. So if you're interested in following along a little further with where this oscilloscope is going to go, you may want to check that out. If you're interested in taking part in my ongoing electronics course on Patreon, I'll put the link just below this video in the description. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. You can learn a little bit more about Patreon there as well. If you do go there, check out the community section. There's lots of people sharing their projects there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.